Well, good morning, Lighthouse. How are we? Good. My name is John Smart. I'm one of the pastors here. It's so good to be with you. Can we welcome those that are joining us online right now, wherever you're watching us, whenever you're watching us, so good to have you with us here. And um, hey, I, we're in our series on Exodus. I think we're on week six, something like that. You're not keeping track, but I am. And so, uh, but before we get into that, I've just got one announcement, which is something we've mentioned a few times. We have a baptism service coming up on October 29th. That is hands down our, one of our favorite things to do here at the church because we're celebrating literal, real life miracles. And so we have uh, people who have met Jesus. He's changed their life. We have dozens of people getting baptized. If that's you, if you want to get baptized, but you haven't signed up yet, this is pretty much your last opportunity because we have two more interest meetings coming up. So if this is something you've thought about, if you're a follower of Jesus and you have not yet been baptized, that is a step of obedience that God commands his followers to do. And we would love to be a part of that with you. And so you can sign up for that on our website. We got a little QR code there. There's one probably on the back of the chair in front of you. It's really hard to get away from uh, obedience to God. And so, um, but sign up for that. You have to go to an interest meeting to get baptized. And um, truly, it is our privilege and honor to walk alongside people who are professing faith in Jesus through baptism. That said, I'm gonna read a passage from Exodus chapter 32. And uh, then we're gonna work through it today. That'll be our text this morning. The context is, as Steve talked about last week, that Moses received the 10 commandments. He received the law, he received the covenant. Um, but while that was happening, he was up on a mountaintop with God for about 40 days and 40 nights. And while he was up there, the people of Israel became restless and fell into sin. It says, beginning in verse one, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't even know what has happened to him. Aaron answered, take off the gold earrings that your wives and your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron and he took what they handed him and he made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. This is after the parting of the Red Sea. This is after the miracles. This is after everything that they've seen. Aaron stands and says, these are your gods. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. And afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. And the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made for themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and have sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought us up out of Egypt. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word. We're not here to play games or to check boxes. We wanna have an encounter with you and we wanna leave here changed. And so we pray, um, that based on the experience of your people in Exodus, that we could glean and grow and be challenged and encouraged. You know where every single one of us is? Those that need to be challenged and those that need to be encouraged and those that need to be built up, Lord, I pray you minister to us as a church, but also minister to us as individuals because you're a good father. You don't see us as just one big group. You see us as sons and daughters and you know what each of us need. And so I pray, Lord, that you're your spirit, you know, which is everywhere at all time. You don't need our invitation, but we just ask your spirit would be present with us in a real, in a special way this morning. In your name, amen. Um, so for those in the room who are parents or, or just those who are around kids, you know, there's a number of assumptions that you can have prior to having kids that are then um, pretty quickly dispelled. All right, let me just work through some of my number one assumptions, all right? Here's a number one assumption that I had, and this is, you know, this is common, but here was the idea. More tired equals more sleep. That was the idea. The more tired a kid is, the more they're going to sleep. That's wrong. 
That's totally wrong. That's not, this is like when you get into higher math and they go, forget everything you learned in that other math. This is kid math. And kid math doesn't make any sense based on any of that. Because here's how it works with my kids. The more tired they are, the harder it is to get them to go to sleep and the more, the, the earlier they'll wake back up. Literally, it's if they go to bed an hour later, they're waking up an hour earlier. It doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any, people will be like, just let them, just skip the nap. Just keep them up late. You come over at 2 a.m. when they're having night terrors. You make that happen. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's all topsy-turvy. It's all backwards still. Nevertheless, that's how it works. At least if you have a good sleeper that they do sleep, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's your blessing. You don't need anything else in life, actually. You got a good sleeping kid. Here's another assumption that, uh, that I came up with. He would say things like this. I, I thought this myself. My kids are never going to manipulate me. <laughs> I, see, I see these parents. They break down the grocery store and buy them a chocolate bar. I'm, they're not going to manipulate me. Are you kidding me? I'm too smart for that. I get manipulated all the time. I, I, the other night, I went upstairs. James and Calvin, were, they, they sleep in the same room, and they're carrying on, and they're yelling, and this happens every single night. I used to think bedtime was the finish line. Bedtime is the starting line of another race, which is please go to bed. If you're a parent, you have no, you know you're going to spend the majority of your time just asking a tired person, please go to sleep. I know you want to. So I went up there. They're carrying on. This is like the millionth time I went up there. I said, hey, listen, guys, you guys need to be quiet. You're carrying on. You're hitting each other. You need to go to sleep. If I have to come up here again, you're going to get in trouble. I'm going through this whole speech. James interrupts me mid-speech. I'm like, if I have to come up here again, you're going to get in trouble. He goes, I like your shirt and pants. <laughs> I said, what? He goes, they, they look really good on you. <laughs> I didn't get it back after that, to be honest with you. It was so blatant. I was like, hey, all right, that was a pretty good. That was pretty good. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another pass on that one. And then there's assumptions that people make about my kids. So my youngest kid, Luke, you've probably seen him out in the foyer. He's got long hair, and we try and do it in a little, like, sumo wrestler thing going on. But um, his beard hasn't come in yet, so people aren't always sure that he's a boy. I get it. I understand that. We were at a party not too long ago, and Luke was being Luke and jumping off cars and pushing people and do all the type of stuff that he does. And there's a lady standing next to me. She had some kind of accent. I'm not sure where she was from, but she goes, I look at her. She goes, let me tell you something. I look. She goes, your daughter, very strong. Very strong. I was like, yes, she is. She is strong. <laughs> She's very strong. You're right. I say all this about assumptions because the assumption that you can make when you hear the story that we just read of Moses coming down off the mountain and the idols are being worshipped, the, the Israelites are worshipping a golden calf, the assumption that you can make is, oh, this is one of those things ancient people used to do. And this doesn't really apply to me anymore. And so let me just sort of skip through to the next part of the story. Maybe that will connect with me more. And if that's your idea, idols don't really play a part anymore, and that's sort of an ancient thing when people would worship little metal things, that's a very common idea, but that's a misconception because the Bible's idea of what an idol is, this whole passage is about the idea of idolatry or worshiping something besides God. It's the idea of idolatry. The Bible's idea of idolatry is much more nuanced than that. Just for our talk this morning, here's a little definition. An idol is a good thing that becomes a God thing. An idol is any sort of good thing that takes God's place in your heart, in your mind, or in your life. So case in point, did anybody catch where the gold came from for the calf? From the earrings, that's right. Does anybody remember where the earrings came from? What did you say? <laughs> anybody? From Egypt. Very good, Austin. From Egypt. You remember why? It says actually that God, as Egypt is, as this nation that's been in slavery for hundreds of years is preparing to leave, it says God made the Egyptians favorably disposed. So they gave the Israelites gold earrings as they were leaving. So this is literally a gift directly from God that in a moment of doubt and fear and panic, they make into an idol. And they go, we don't know about that God because we've been waiting for a couple weeks now. Here are the gods that we are to worship. 
An idol, that's a picture of an idol. Any good thing, any gift, beautiful, we tend to think of idols as ugly or disorder or bad thing. They tend to be good things that simply become God things. And so an idol could be um, Baal is the storm god of the Canaanites, the god of fertility, but an idol could also be comfort or the need to be liked. Good things that then become God things. Asherah was a distracting, wicked goddess during uh, the time of Israel in the first and second kingdom. But there's also the gods of career success and financial stability and health and beauty and sexuality. All of these are good things that can become God things. There's Molech, the god, the abomination God calls him, the Amorites. But there's also the gods of distraction and of noise and of addiction. An idol is anything that exerts a controlling influence over your heart and over your life. An idol is anything, we don't tend to think of it like this, but subconsciously an idol is anything that we would believe, as long as I have this, I'm okay. And if I don't have this, my kids, my spouse, my job, my house, my this, my that. If I don't have this, then I'm lost. I don't even know who I am. And all of us have these things in our life that we tend to gravitate to. If you like Rocky, here's a little Rocky quote for you. You remember when Rocky's talking about the fight and he goes, if I could just go the distance, then I'd know I'm not a bum. All of us have a, if I could just, if I could just get married, if I could just get that degree, if I could just this, or if I could just get their respect, if I could just get this title, if I, we all have a, if I could just then I'll know that I'm good enough. That's an idol. It's something that we're subconsciously drawn towards. This is why St. Augustine said, it's not that we have, that we love bad things, actually. He said the primary problem is that we love the right things, we just love them out of order. And so he had this idea of disordered loves, and we recognize this. If you met someone who clearly loved their career more than their kids, you would say that's probably disordered. That's a disordered love. When anything takes God's place in our heart, it's a disordered love and it becomes an idol. Now, that said, I just wanna work through, because maybe this sounds a little like ideological or theoretical or something like that. Why are idols bad? Great question. You always ask the right question at right when I need a transition in the sermon. Let me give three reasons why idols are bad. A personal reason, a practical reason, and a theological reason. Here's the personal. Idols are bad because idols require sacrifice. An idol starts with it serving you. That's the idea. But the further and further you go along, the more sacrifice it requires, and eventually you end up serving it. There's a secular um, author by the name of David Foster Wallace, not a Christian by any degree to my knowledge. Nevertheless, he had one of the most startling observations about worship and idolatry that I've ever heard, and he made it during a college commencement address. And this is what he said. Because here's something else that's true. This is David Foster Wallace speaking to college students. Listen to what he says about idolatry and about worship. In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah or Yahweh or the Wiccan Mother Goddess or the Four Noble Truths or some infrangible set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they're where you tap your real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel like you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. On one level, we already know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths and proverbs and cliches and bromides and epigrams and parables, the skeleton of every great story. The trick is to keep that truth up front in the daily consciousness. Worship power, and you will feel weak and afraid. You'll feel the need for ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect being seen as smart and you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out and so on. 
What's he saying? The idols that we think serve us, actually, we end up serving them. So it starts as the, as the dream job. Man, this is what I wanted my whole life to do. And then slowly by slowly, year by year, you realize, man, I'm not spending any time with my family. And then you have to ask, hey, who's actually serving who? It starts out, man, let's take another thing. Let's take an addiction like pornography. It starts out as either fun or this is just how I relax. And then as time goes on, you realize, wait a second, I have more and more shame and guilt. And now it's costing me more and more relationships. Who's actually serving who? Idols require more and more sacrifice. And eventually, they'll eat us alive. Second reason why idols are um, bad is because idols are very difficult to see. So you might say, okay, well, you have an idol, you know, we have idols, let's just get them out, you know, just kick them out. The problem is, you and I, our hearts have a million built in defense systems, so that doesn't actually happen. We're very good. I'm very good, you're very good at defending our idols. So we're very good at saying, I'm not really a workaholic, I just really wanna provide for my family even though I never get to see them. Or I I don't worship my kids, I just really love them and if you criticize them, then we're not gonna be friends anymore. Hey, I don't, you know, I'm not a people pleaser, that's not my problem, it's just, if you, you know, say something mean to me, then I, I'm going to crumble into the abyss. It's, we're very good at sort of finding our own ways to sort of justify and defend. And I believe it was John Calvin who said, the human heart is an idol-making factory. And I would add, and we're just as good at defending those idols and justifying those idols and explaining those idols. And so it's very difficult to see. We all have a blind spot when it comes to this. And then third, the third reason why idols are bad is theological because idols block our relationship with God. Just like the story in Israel, where Aaron says, don't worry about Yahweh anymore. Uh, this, these are the gods that have led you out. These golden images are the ones who have led you out of Egypt. An idol blocks our relationship with God because it takes his place. And God, knowing, here's, here's, here's the issue. God knows, number one, that idols will eat us alive, and he knows that they're gonna take us further and further and further away from him. I heard one time uh, Oprah was saying she decided to stop going to church. This was years ago, so maybe she's amended her position. I don't know. I'm sorry, Oprah, if you're watching this, but. (laughs) She said she decided to stop going to church one day when she heard a sermon. She heard the the pastor preached a passage that said that God became jealous. And she said, how can I serve a God who was jealous? And I remember hearing that, and I remember thinking back on that, going, I wonder if Oprah has ever loved anybody. Because if you love somebody, and you see them engaged in something that not only leads them further away from you, but is actively hurting them, If there's no emotional response, how could you say that you actually love them? Like if I saw my kids getting wrapped up with a person or with a substance that was taking them away from me and was destroying their lives and I did nothing about it, how cold and indifferent could I be? How how cold hearted as a parent would that be? So when God said he's jealous, it's not like, oh, I'm so mad that you're not giving me my attention. No, God knows, Ecclesiastes says, God has placed eternity in our hearts. And you know what God knows? The only thing that can sustain the weight of your soul is God himself. Everything else will break underneath us or crush us. And because God knows that, because he knows these idols eventually will eat us alive, because he loves us that much, that's why there's a holy love and a holy jealousy to go. Because he's devoted to our freedom and he loves us. That's why God is opposed to idols. Not because God is a megalomaniac that needs your praise to feel good about himself. He doesn't. We need to praise him because it's what we were designed for. And anything else that fills that space because we will worship something, anything else will crush us. On a long enough timeline, anything we worship besides God It's not eternal enough to sustain our souls. So what do we do? This has been a fun sermon, huh? Real (laughs) pick-me-up. What do we do? 
if sermons are, or if uh, idols are hard to see, nevertheless, we're all sort of prone to them. What does God do? If Sammy preached a couple weeks ago that God is radically committed to his glory and he's radically committed to our freedom. And so if he loves us that much, what is God's response? Well, the Bible gives a very clear answer, but you may not like the answer because I don't like the answer very much, but that doesn't make it any less true. Here's the truth. Trials reveal our idols. When you look through the pages of Scripture, story after story, Abraham, David, Joseph, Peter, Paul. You pick any hero of the faith that you like, and you know what you'll see? They went through a season of trial, and they went through a season of wilderness, and God used that to draw something out of them. Trials, as terrible as they can be, there's a beautiful moment in a trial when your idol becomes visible. And we realize, oh, this is the thing that I really trust in. So I have this thing. I've mentioned this before. It's not a big deal. Uh, but every now and then, uh, I'll get this thing called PVCs, which is like an irregular heart rhythm, where it feels like my heart is going around normal, and then it kind of skips a beat, and then there's an extra hard heartbeat, and uh, then it sort of gets back into it. And so I've had that. I've had, because of that, I've had my heart checked out a million, billion times where I've had an echocardiogram and, you know, they've looked at everything and I've worn heart monitors and all this type, I've done all this type of stuff where they're all saying, let's see, I know what you're feeling, but let me see what's actually happening in your heart right now. Let me tell you the truth. If you are in a trial, that is a heart monitor where you're able to see here's what's actually happening in your soul. Because when we're in pain, or when we're scared, or when we're worried, or when our sort of ego begins to crumble, all of a sudden we can actually see, this is what I was really trusting in all along. This is the thing that I was hoping was gonna make it all right. And I thought it was God, but it was actually this. In a, in a trial, just for a moment, the mask is pulled off and we can see the idols that control us. Let me give you a personal example. About a year ago, I've been preaching for about 10, 10 years now, about a year ago, I started to experience this thing where, every, where before I would speak, either in small groups or big groups, I would get extremely anxious, like extremely anxious before I would speak. And that freaked me out. And it freaked me out for a number of reasons. Number one, because I was extremely anxious. But number two, because with that came all these fears of, oh, what if I can't speak anymore? What, I can't, what if I can't overcome this? What if I can't figure this out? Or what if this is the end? And you know what I realized in that? I realized how much of my identity came from preaching. And I realized that I was actually trusting in preaching to provide for me rather than God. And so I realized, oh, wait a second. I'm supposed to get my identity from God. I'm getting it from this. I'm supposed to get, I'm supposed to trust God. He's supposed to be my hiding place, but I'm getting it from this. That never would have been revealed outside of the trial. That a trial in God's mercy he pulls back the veil on our heart to say, let me show you what's really going on. Doesn't make it easy. Doesn't make it fun. But there's a beautiful opportunity to grow if we ask God, where, where are my idols and how are you showing me them? So what do we do? Practically speaking, God shows us our idols sometimes through trials. Maybe you're aware of it, but but how does it work? What, let me get real practical as we break this down. What do we actually do about idols? And then we'll be done. What does it look like to, type, to topple idols? Three things. Number one, we topple idols by awareness. Simply being aware of the things you are prone to worship outside of God makes a tremendous difference. So um, at the church office, we, we're doing... Um, the IT guys are sending out this thing where uh, they'll send out training for scam emails because there's a lot of scam emails that are going around, you know? Actually, I don't know if you remember this. Do you guys remember like last couple, maybe last year, a couple years ago, someone made a fake Sammy Foster email address and then he started emailing people asking for Google Play gift cards? You remember this? No? Some of you were like, that wasn't Sammy? I need that Google Play <laughs> gift card. Sammy's never going to email you asking for a Google Play gift card. I don't think anybody uses Google Play gift cards, to be honest with you. But 
So we got these sort of like these office um, things that'll show, hey, here's what scams could look like. Here's what a phishing email looks like. All that to say, if you know scams are out there, you're much less likely to be taken advantage of. If you know the deposed prince of Nigeria is probably not gonna email you directly to send you his fortune in advance for when he comes to America, you're probably much less likely to be taken advantage of. In the same way, simply being aware and going, oh yeah, I have a propensity to worship that thing rather than God. It's lost a large part of its power over you. This is why Hebrews 12:1 says, let us run our race with perseverance and throw off the sin that so easily entangles. Every single one of us, myself included, we all have a sin that so easily entangles. And you may never fully disentangle, but if you know it's there, it's lost a lot of power. If you know what you're prone to worship outside of God, it's lost a lot of its hold on your heart because idols love to operate in the dark. Here's the second thing we can do. This plays into that. Number one is awareness. Number two is confession. <coughs> Sorry. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German pastor who led the resistance, uh, church resistance in Nazi Germany while Hitler was in power, said the following. Listen to this and see if it maybe applies to you. Sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. And you know what his solution to that was? Confession. See, we tend to think of confession mainly between us and God, which is beautiful, that God, let me confess my sins and receive forgiveness, and that is 100% true but there's also a really powerful confession that comes with our brothers and sisters. James says, confess your sins one to another and you will be healed. And there's some debate, is it physical healing? Is it spiritual healing? It's both. In confession, hey, let me tell you something that's been weighing down my soul. I've been wrestling with this. Could you pray for me in this? Could you hold me accountable to this? Could you, and if you see, man, I couldn't do that. I couldn't open up. I couldn't tell them. That's your idol protecting itself, not protecting you because you confess and you drag it into the light and sunlight is the best disinfectant. Sunlight is the best disinfectant to go, here's what I'm struggling with. This is what's just happening in my heart. Help me with this. It loses so much of its power. See, the idol will tell you, your sin will tell you, your addiction will tell you. You can't confess because the other side of that confession, people are gonna lose respect for you they're not gonna trust you anymore. They're not gonna like you anymore. So you can't just keep it in the dark, just deal with it. But that is a lie, because here's the truth. On the other side of confession isn't judgment. On the other side of confession is freedom and grace. This is why First John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I believe there may be some in this room right now that you have carried your sin all on your own. You fought your idol all on your own because you really believe if you take it into the light, you'll lose everything. Let me hear it. Let me tell you real clear. When you take it into the light, you break it and the chains are broken and freedom is on the other side of that. And then lastly, how do we topple idols? It's awareness, it's confession, and then finally, it's beholding. If I was a really good preacher, I would have made this ABC. But... <laughs> You get what you pay for. <laughs> what do I mean beholding? Second Corinthians says, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. It's a really interesting passage where it says, the way you become like Jesus is by fixing your eyes on Jesus. The way you become like Jesus is by looking to Jesus and contemplating Jesus and thinking about Jesus and reading about Jesus. That's how you become like Jesus. Here's why I say this is an important part of, top, important part of toppling idols. Because the more we look to Jesus, the less power idols will have over us. Why? 
because idols demand sacrifice from you, Jesus was sacrificed for you. And the more you look to a God that doesn't demand more and more and more and more shame and more guilt and more this and more that, but you look to a God who freely opened his veins on your behalf, and he's the God of glory and loves you from the end to the beginning, the more we look at him, the less appealing idols will look. Why would I leave him for that? It's only when we forget what God has done to us that idols begin, their tentacles begin to wrap around our heart again. And so we topple idols by being aware, by confessing our sin and dragging it into the light, and then by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, denying its shame. Behold him. Let him as a good and beautiful king fill your heart and serving anything else begins to lose its appeal. This isn't a one and done thing. I'm not gonna try and oversell this. This is a lifelong battle, but you can have victory. And day by day, month by month, year by year, you can walk in more and more freedom, more and more joy, more and more peace. In a moment, we're gonna end just with an opportunity to respond. Let me just say this, as a parent, there's these times sometime where my kids will, they'll either pick up something sharp, like a tool, or they'll be near something dangerous, or they'll get near the road, or they'll get near fire, or something like that, and I'll call out to them, and I'll say, hey, hey, put that down, come over here, you know, that's dangerous, and they'll look at me, and there's always this moment where they don't quite trust me, or they think I'm trying to take something from them. And I, my heart, what I'm trying to communicate to them, when I see them holding something dangerous or near some type of danger, what I wanna say is, I'm your dad. I've been there the whole time. Been there when you couldn't sleep at night. Been there early in the morning, fed you from the time you could not feed yourself. I want what's best for you. I'm not trying to take something from you. I'm trying to give something to you. And in the same way, when we talk about idols, there can be this thing that rises up in us as if God himself is trying to take the joy out of our life and he's trying to take something good from us. Hear me, God is not trying to take something good from you. He's trying to give something good to you. He wants to give you freedom. He wants to give you joy. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you purpose. But to do so, we have to be willing to let go of our idols and say, okay, God, I trust you. I'm looking to you for my trust, for my security, for my peace, for my strength, for my healing. So here's what we're going to do. I, I don't want to just talk about idols and then, and then be like, okay, I hope you guys figure that out and do something with that. I want to give us an opportunity to respond. So I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up to the sides of our stage, this side and that side. If you're on a prayer team, if you're a pastor, if you're an elder, if you wouldn't mind coming up right now. And the band is going to play instrumental for a few moments. And I want to give us an opportunity to come up and to pray. Maybe you go, hey, I just, I just want more awareness of what my idols are. We'll pray for that. You go, hey, I, I just really, I want to confess. I've carried this on my own, and I want to bring it into the light. This is my idol. Would you pray for me? We'll do that. Or if you go, you know what? Um, I just want to behold more of Jesus. I want the freedom that he offers. We'll do that as well. But what, what I don't want to do, listen, listen. This isn't a game. This is about your soul. And so heaven forbid I just do a speech and then sort of just leave it into the ether. We wanna do work this morning, amen? We go to church to leave here more free, amen? Right? Am I alone on that? <laughs> we go to church to have an encounter with God. This is our opportunity to break the hold of idols over our heart and to leave here more free. So the band is gonna play. And um, if you feel that stirring, I believe that's the Holy Spirit. If something has just sort of tinged your heart as we work through this, don't leave here without addressing that. And then we're going to close in worship. Jesus, thank you for giving us a way out. Your word says, no temptation has assailed us that is not common to man. And you don't give us anything that's too much for us to bear and that you always provide a way out. And so for those in this room that feel like I can't get out, 
Lord, I pray your spirit would meet them. I pray that um, you'd draw many. You'd provide freedom and peace and joy in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been so good to come together to do church with one another. And as we close out, maybe you heard that invitation from Pastor John to come forward to receive prayer. And as you're watching online, maybe you just found yourself really wanting to do that, wishing that you were here able to do that. I want to encourage you right now that no matter where you're watching from, no matter when you are watching, we have pastors and leaders who would love to have a personal conversation with you, who would love to pray with you. And as you're watching online, one of the best ways to get in touch with our team would be through live chat, what we call LH chat. And that's available via the chat button on our website, on our app. But we have people here who are willing and able to talk with you, to help you any way that we can. We'd love to do that. We'd be honored to do that. And I'd encourage you right now, if there's something that you want to talk through and receive prayer for personally, to take advantage of that, to go to our website, go to our app, start that conversation. As we close out, I do just want to take a moment here collectively as well to respond in prayer. I know we've had some requests come in specific for needs and individual lives. And so we certainly want to lift up all of those as well as anything else you might have now, perhaps an unspoken request. And so as we come together here in just a moment and pray, you know, some of the things that we want to include in our prayer here, I saw a request from Jason who just said that he could use a lot of prayers and the Lord knows your needs, Jason. And we just want to lift up whatever's going on and uh, join you in prayer there. Bobby specifically mentioned uh, lower back pain and hip pain. She's just seeking prayer for relief from that pain. And so we want to include Bobby in our prayer here. Ewitt mentioned um, just he's lost several people recently, four people to overdose, one to brain cancer. And so just uh, for peace and comfort in the midst of that loss, which we're so sorry to hear all that you've been through recently and all of those impacted by those losses. Cheryl, um, kind of similar, that she's lost two people in her family this week alone to cancer. And so we want to lift her up, include her in our prayer, um, as well as her request just to stay in remission in her own fight with cancer. And so these are some of the needs, some of the requests that are presented. Perhaps there's more I didn't get a chance to read. And even as you're watching On Demand, maybe there's something that you want to include. I just want us all just to pause here to take a moment to lift these different things up. And I invite you right now, would you pray with me? Lord, I just want to begin here as we come together, as we come to you, just uh, just to individually, Lord, I just want to take a moment here just for all of us, Lord, to just ask for awareness. If there's any idols in our lives, Lord, would you give us awareness of those? Maybe we're, if we're missing them, would you just help bring them to the surface? Help us to see them so clearly, Lord so that we could deal with them rightly. And right now, maybe there's something on our mind that we just want to confess right now. We just want to give it to you right now, Lord, and just ask for your forgiveness. If it comes to our mind later in the same way, Lord, we just want to commit that. We want to bring this thing to you. We want to confess it to you. We want to name it so that we can give it to you. We can work through this, Lord. We want to do this. And as we do all this, we just want to behold you, who you are, how great you are, Lord God. We behold you and... uh, as we do these things, we just want to work through any idols that are in our lives. We want to ultimately put them in their right place so that we could put you in the right place in our lives, Lord God. And as we seek to do all this, I just also want to lift up all these specific needs and requests that are present. I know so many different requests we just mentioned, uh, those who are mourning the loss of friends and loved ones, we just want to seek you and ask for peace and comfort in these situations, Lord for those going through their own health concerns right now, just praying for comfort, relief from that pain being felt, for physical healing, Lord, in so many different needs, in so many different circumstances, Lord. We just want to lift up each and every one of these things to you in our own life and those around us in this church, Lord, and we give them to you. We ask that you would just help in these different areas in a way that only you could. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, thank you so much for joining us. We cannot wait to see you again soon.